In this video, we continue our journey through a variety of different types of electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions or EAS reactions for short. We're spending so much time on these types of reactions because they are very synthetically useful to functionalize aromatic rings, meaning attach additional functional groups onto aromatic rings which ultimately make these types of structures generally very biologically active, meaning suitable as potential drugs and things of that sort. And indeed, an array of different drug molecules have aromatic rings as one of the groups within that complex drug molecule. So in this particular video, we are going to look at the reaction that I have shown an example of on screen here, which is the so-called friedel crafts acylation, named after the scientists that developed this particular reaction. So what's going to happen in this friedel crafts acylation reaction is we will start, for purposes of our examples, with benzene. We are going to react with an acyl halide. That is what I am showing right here. Is what we refer to as our acyl halide. Typically, it is acyl chlorides. We'll react with an aluminum chloride catalyst right here, ALCL3. I'm going to go ahead and label that catalyst as a reminder for us. And the outcome of the reaction is that one of the hydrogen atoms from the aromatic ring will be replaced with a so-called acyl group. The acyl group is our carbonyl group directly connected to that R group, which the R group is an alkyl group of some sort. So we refer to this as an acyl group, A-C-Y-L. So in our acyl halide, this part of the molecule that I'm highlighting with my laser pointer would be described as the acyl group. And then of course the chlorine is our halide portion of that molecule. So much like with the other EAS reactions that we've looked at so far, we're going to focus on the mechanism for this reaction in this video to compare and contrast how this re reaction relates to the other EAS reactions that we have learned about earlier. As we begin to think about the mechanism for friedel crafts acylation, one of the things that I've been trying to do in the last few videos is develop this theme that although the reactions may look a little bit different initially when we're comparing different EAS reactions, they all follow the same template of beginning by forming a stronger electrophile, often via the reaction of something with a catalyst. Secondly, pi electrons from the aromatic ring attack that electrophile to yield the carbocation, the so-called arenium, which is non-aromatic. And then in order to restore the aromaticity of the arenium, it loses a proton in order to become the final organic product with no net formal charge. So let's take a look at these three steps as applied toward the friedel crafts acylation. So I'm going to go ahead and draw in the upper right corner of our board here, the reaction that we will focus on where we're going to take benzene, we'll react it with acetyl chloride and aluminum trichloride, AlCl3, as an essential catalyst to this reaction progressing at any measurable speed. And what's going to result from this reaction mixture is that we would observe as the major organic product that the acyl group via the carbonyl becomes directly connected to the aromatic ring. And then whatever the R group was here that I'm highlighting is just a methyl group here is going to be bonded out here off of the ring. And this could be a methyl group, ethyl group, whatever you want as your chain or ring here attached out on the outside of the aromatic molecule. So let's look through the mechanism for this reaction. So first things first, I'm gonna bracket off here that our first objective is to form a stronger electrophile. So I'm gonna put form strong Electrophile is my reminder of what we are doing here following our general template of how we do different types of electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions. So in order to form the strong electrophile in this particular case, we will take our acetyl chloride and we'll react it with the aluminum trichloride AlCl3. And what's going to happen here in the AlCl3. We could think of this AlCl3 as behaving pretty analogously to the iron trichloride or iron tribromide that we talked about in the last video, in that the iron would form a bond to a chlorine or a bromine atom. Similarly, the aluminum is also going to form a covalent bond to the chlorine atom over here. And so what we can go ahead and do 
is show that bond forming via the lone pair electrons from the chlorine acting as the nucleophile forming a covalent bond to the electrophilic metal here. And that metal is quite electrophilic because it's bonded to the three electron withdrawing chlorine atoms here. And so we'll go ahead and draw out what results from that. So we have our AlCl3, and I'm not gonna draw out all those chlorines explicitly in this case, I'm just abbreviating as AlCl3. We have a new bond between aluminum and our chlorine. So I'm showing that new bond in red, and then I'm drawing that chlorine from our acyl halide right here. It's going to have two sets of lone pair electrons. The third set of lone pair electrons formed that red bond over to the aluminum. And then I draw out my carbonyl group here and calculate my formal charges. And for formal charges, we're going to end up calculating a plus one formal charge on the chlorine. And that means that aluminum is going to have to have a negative formal charge to counter it so that we have a net charge of zero, just like we had a net charge of zero when we started over here. We have to maintain that total overall formal charge. And now what has happened here is that we have created a system where if we break away this carbon chlorine bond right here, that is going to yield a resonance stabilized intermediate and be a relatively favorable thing to happen as a result of the fact that this product is going to be stabilized by resonance. So let's see what I mean here. So if we break this carbon chlorine bond right here like so, that is going to result in the chlorine atom having a third set of lone pair electrons, so one set, two set, three sets. It's gonna be directly bonded to that AlCl3 still, and the aluminum's still gonna have a negative formal charge on it because it still has the same number of covalent bonds up here that it does down here. And then as our organic product of this step, we've broken the bond between the acyl group, which I'm highlighting, and the chlorine right here. We broke that bond. And so as a result, we are going to have a structure that has our carbonyl group directly bonded to another carbon and that carbon is bonded to the methyl group. So I'm showing this explicitly just to remind myself of what I need to use as formal charges and things here because it's kind of a funny looking structure. So we have our oxygen that I copied over, carbon from the carbonyl which is right here bonded to a methyl group, which is right here, and we broke that carbon-chlorine bond. And so calculating formal charges, our carbon of the carbonyl only has three covalent bonds and no lone pairs, so it's going to have our plus one formal charge on it. And now this intermediate is stabilized by resonance, and that explains why this is able to form, is that by resonance, using that special resonance arrow there, we can illustrate that this exists as two resonance forms, the one that I have shown here, and then if we take the lone pair electrons from the oxygen, we can bring those down and create this rather unusual situation where we are making a carbon-oxygen triple bond. So we have our carbon bonded to our methyl group, and then that same carbon is also connected via a triple bond now to our oxygen atom, and the oxygen is gonna have a lone pair of electrons on it. So we took our oxygen, we had two sets of lone pair electrons, took one of those sets down to make a carbon-oxygen triple bond, that's right here. And that, as a result, is going to mean there's no formal charge now on the carbon because carbon now has four covalent bonds. The oxygen, on the other hand, now is going to be where the positive formal charge resides because if you calculate the formal charge on this oxygen, you will find you come up with plus one. As it turns out, despite the fact that this oxygen has a positive formal charge on it, this is the more stable of the two resonance structures because this structure has more covalent bonds in more atoms that have a complete octet. And those two factors are more important than formal charge in determining the stability of resonance structures. Um, but nonetheless, the overall picture here is that the fact that there is resonance helps facilitate this in forming because it allows that positive charge to be shared over two atoms. So this is certainly going to be a stronger electrophile than what we started with because in our starting structure, when we had our acetyl chloride, we didn't have that carbocation present in our reaction flask. And now we've created a carbocation here as one of these two resonance structures, and that is going to be very electrophilic as a carbocation. And so second step of the mechanism, now that we've made that stronger electrophile, is that the pi electrons from the aromatic ring are going to attack that electrophile. And by the way, we refer to that electrophile as the acyllium ion. So we can refer to this 
either of these two resonance structures are both referred to as the acilium. And the IUM, just like we have mentioned uh, in some of the videos about rheniums, the IUM indicates a positive formal charge. So this is referring to a situation where the acyl group has a positive formal charge on it. So it's our acilium. All right, so let's go ahead and do the next step here. So we're gonna take our aromatic ring, drawing out my pattern of single bond, double bond to get that conjugated all the way around. I'm gonna draw in two of my hydrogen atoms explicitly here so we can illustrate what exactly is happening. And we can take either of our two acilium resonance structures and plop those down here to show what's happening at this next step. So I'm gonna go ahead and use the resonance structure on the right there. Again, we could use either of the two resonance structures. It doesn't matter. What does matter is that you're going to show the attack of the pi electrons occurring on the carbocation or the carbon right here, in other words. So we've attacked that electrophilic carbon atom right here. We would not attack this oxygen, even though the oxygen has a positive charge, it can't accept a pi bond because that would cause it to end up being um, a less stable situation than by attacking the carbon right here. So the favorable thing is for the pi bond to come over, attack the carbon atom, because that is going to lead us to an arenium ion. So we'll go ahead and draw out that arenium ion, drawing in my hydrogen atoms, and we've got a new bond between carbon and carbon here. So this is one of the ways that we can make a new carbon-carbon bond, and that makes this reaction noteworthy in and of itself because there aren't that many ways to make new carbon-carbon bonds, and this is one of them. So we've expanded our toolkit of ways to create carbon-carbon bonds to take simple molecules and build ones that are more complex. So we had the pi bond come over, attack the carbon right here. That gives us our carbonyl directly bonded to our CH3. And we're going to end up then with our positive formal charge in the arenium right here. So now we're down to the home stretch. Part three of this is lose that beta proton from right here, beta relative to the positive charge being at the alpha position. So at this adjacent carbon, we call that the beta position. It's going to lose our proton in order to restore aromaticity. Let's zoom out so that we can take a look at what's going on there. All right, so just redrawing my arenium to get us into step three here our last part of this reaction. Drawing out my line angle formula for my acyl group there. Draw in my proton, plop in my positive formal charge right here, and then going ahead with this, keeping in mind, I'm gonna write down our general reminder here of what we're doing at this step, is we are losing a proton by reacting with a base to restore the aromaticity. So how do we go about doing that? Well, we have to think about the definition of our aluminum trichloride. We defined that when we were initially discussing this reaction. We said that the aluminum trichloride acts as a catalyst, meaning that if we were to measure the concentration of aluminum trichloride at the beginning of the reaction, let the reaction run for a few hours and come back, we find that the concentration of aluminum trichloride was the same. And so that means that since we consumed aluminum trichloride up here at the beginning of the reaction, that later on in the reaction, we need to restore the aluminum trichloride. So after we formed that strong electrophile, what we were left with was this aluminum bonded to four chlorine atoms right here that I'm highlighting kind of toward the middle of the screen with my laser pointer. And so what we need to do in order to restore AlCl3 is we need to lose a chlorine from this molecule. And so what we will do is use that as our base in order to regenerate the aluminum trichloride catalyst. So I'm going to write it AlCl3. The aluminum has a negative formal charge on it. And what we can do is use, in order to keep in mind that we need to restore the aluminum trichloride, we can use the bond between the aluminum and chlorine as our base. Comes over, grabs the proton right here from our beta position, that forces the carbon-hydrogen bond to break and come over here to restore the aromaticity by forming a pi bond. So we go ahead and write out our pi bond right here. And we're gonna have our acyl group bonded there, our hydrogen, 
and our other products of this reaction would be HCl because we used the chlorine from our AlCl4 to come over and act as a base to grab that proton from our arrhenium. So that gives us HCl. And then our other product of that reaction is going to be AlCl3, aluminum trichloride. So we have restored the aluminum trichloride, allowing it to fit that definition of catalyst here. So now this is ready to roll to catalyze more reactions. So when you are looking at reactions in the future, if you see an aromatic ring reacted with an acyl halide, meaning a carbonyl group directly bonded to a halogen, that's what we refer to as an acyl halide, and there can be any sort of R group chain or ring over here, plus the aluminum chloride catalyst, what you're going to anticipate happening is an electrophilic aromatic substitution where one of the hydrogen atoms from the aromatic ring is replaced with the carbonyl group and whatever R group was associated with it in the final organic product of that reaction. This reaction follows the same mechanistic step paradigm that we've been developing all the way through, where we started by forming a stronger electrophile. In this case, it was the so-called acillium, where the carbonyl was our electrophilic atom that got attacked by the pi bonds to give our arrhenium. The arrhenium then is attacked by the AlCl4 chloride in order to grab that proton to restore the aromaticity and also regenerate that aluminum trichloride catalyst to undergo another cycle of the reaction.